Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's set of policy study breakfast panel on the future of the railways. Uh, I think it's quite rare to start uh, a breakfast meeting absolutely on time, uh, but I'm told we've got a room full of railway experts, so perhaps that speaks well for the future of the industry. Um, my name is Tom Flockerty. I'm actually head of tax policy at CPS. Uh, fortunately, however, you don't have to rely too much on my expertise this morning because we've assembled what I think is an exceptional panel for you. Um, in a little while, you're going to be hearing from Sir Patrick McLaughlin, MP, uh, who was Transport Secretary from 2012 to 2016, a uh, period that saw significant investment into the railways. Uh, we've got Susan Evans, uh, who's Managing Director of Urban Services at Ulster, a global player in the railway market. Um, we're going to hear from Paul Plummer, uh, who is Chief Executive of the Rail Delivery Group, uh, an industry body for the railways, uh, actually both public and private, he pointed out to me before this. Um, he was previously Strategy Director at Network Rail. Uh, finally, we're going to have my sometimes colleague, Tony Lodge, a uh, research fellow at CPS, really our main man on railway policy, uh, an advocate of open access reform. Uh, he's also political Director of Political Communications and New Century Media. Uh, the format is pretty straightforward. We're going to give each of our panelists uh, about four minutes for opening remarks, and then we're going to have a moderated discussion up here on the panel. Uh, I say moderated, although obviously I'll be pushing for as much radicalism as possible uh, before we throw it over to questions from the audience. Uh, we'll wrap up hopefully as promptly as we started at 9 a.m. Uh, our running order is going to be Tony, Paul, Susan, and then Sir Patrick. Uh, so, Tony, if you'd like to kick us off, please. Well, thank you very much indeed. And um, I'd like to think uh, consistency means something these days. We produced this uh, seven years ago uh, called Rail Second Chance, uh, putting competition back in track. Um, this was following the first West Coast Main Line debacle, you may say, when uh, the DMT uh, basically got its numbers wrong, the likely premium paybacks from that franchise. And we asked ourselves, well, what really can we do? with the railways, um, and what should we be doing with the railways, particularly the intercity network as we still call it. Um, the conclusions which we uh, reached after some extensive research was that there had been allowed to be, and this is a really important point, we have the Railways Act in 1993, um, followed by a very encouraging uh, white paper in 1992. I spoke to John McGregor, Lord McGregor, about this not too long ago, who was responsible for the white paper um, in which it was uh, decided that real uh, aviation style competition could exist on the intercity network and that there could be kind of city concessions for the commuter network as we know it, modeled today on London Overground, one might say. We believe that the railways really do now, uh, as regards a conservative vision, we're in the last chance saloon. Um, it won't be hard for Corbyn, should he win, to renationalize the whole thing. Network rail is already in public hands. Uh, its debts are on the Treasury's books. All he has to do is allow franchises to end, and then he takes them under DOR, which is the government of the company, which is run by the DFT to run uh, franchises. Um, that will happen with a Corbyn and McDonald led operation. Um, so we have one last chance. I think the last chance is Paul Keith Williams. Uh, it's really important that the Keith Williams review comes out with the right. Um, conclusions in our opinion, and that has to be, particularly with regards to the intercity network, network, genuine, real, credible competition amongst long distance high speed rail operations across the country, and I am not just talking with all buffers stopping at London, I'm talking about operation, high speed operations city to city, uh, not just the main London terminals, um, the other operation which people need to understand in my opinion is the very successful, tried and tested, embedded success of the East Coast Main Line, where the franchise, which has had many guises, LNER, GNER, National Express, East Coast, DOR, has actually had to compete with two open access fast operators, Hull Trains and Grand Central, since the early part of the last decade, with huge success. The premium on the East Coast Main Line franchise has not declined. We have a large amount of uh, spare roaming stock now coming online, which can be used by uh, competing operators, as we have what's called IEP, the Intercity Express program, the fancy Azuma trains you're seeing on the East Coast Main Line. They're now coming on, 
the existing uh, electric and diesel stock is available, same with the Great Western. The trains are there, the drive is there, we need Keith Williams to recommend it, and then we need a railways bill next year, and then we need an act of parliament. If it's not a bill, if it's not an act, I fear that consequently won't be radical enough, which will actually have the, uh, the omens in it. So we need radical action, we need to change the way the railways on the intercity uh, express route on the Great West Coast Mainline, Great Western, East Coast Mainline, and we should also look at the South Western routes, Exeter, Bournemouth and elsewhere, but for the commuter lines we should look at city concessions. Thank you. Perfect. <coughs> All right, over to you. Uh, thank you. I'd like to start just by setting out a few comments on on the challenges and opportunities uh, we face uh, today, because I think they're quite different to where, uh, where they were 20 years ago when uh, uh, the major change in the railway. So the, the challenges in terms of our economy today, rebalancing that economy, enabling uh, growth uh, in that economy uh, in a post-Brexit world, absolutely critical. Um, and the growth we've seen uh, is one of the things that is, raises those further challenges and opportunities uh, to, to take that forward. Customer expectations haven't grown massively uh, over that period, and quite rightly, uh, so we need to continue to improve. Uh, fundamentally, we have to keep investing in the railway uh, in order to deliver on those uh, challenges and opportunities. We can't stop that investment, whatever we do about how we're organising. Uh, HS2, I think, is a fundamental part of all of that story is, as the whole railway, how we connect communities right across the country um, and uh, rebalance that economy. Uh, but while the, the railway is, is a key part of uh, what we can do to promote economic growth, we're very clear that uh, the status quo in terms of how we're organised isn't uh, the best way of responding to those challenges and opportunities. Uh, that's why we're very keen to uh, see the Williams Review uh, kicked off and we've been engaging very much with, with that review. Uh, we hope it results in a, in a white paper which people can get behind uh, and uh, drive us forward. Uh, we think it's time for that uh, once-in-a-generational reform of the railway. A uh, number of parts of that, we've set out our proposals, a uh, number of building blocks. Uh, fundamentally, we think that the existing one-size-fits-all franchise system needs to be replaced with a suite of contracts, different sorts of contracts for different markets. Uh, Tony's already emphasised the importance or the opportunity of having genuine competition in some parts of the railway, in some markets. Uh, should be really clear that it only works in some markets in our view. Uh, capacity and other issues means that's not appropriate everywhere, but it can play a role uh, in some of those markets. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, if you like, in uh, uh, some of the metro city commuter type uh, routes, uh, the opportunity there of a much more tightly specified uh, concession type contract like we see on London Overground, we think that potentially the way forward, particularly we've got multimodal choices, uh, that's an opportunity there. Uh, and in the middle, if you like, then the, we really need to move towards outcome-based contracts uh, that enable innovation and delivery of, of railway services fundamentally for customers. But the heart of all of this has to be a much clearer and stronger focus on customers, over to customers, not just passengers but freight as well. The customers, because we need to have a mindset uh, about serving them and, and having a choice uh, about how they travel, whether they travel. So uh, we're very clear on that. All of those, that suite of contracts, if you like, in our view, needs to be uh, underpinned by uh, an independent arms length body at the national level to join things up, uh, independent and arms length of government to enable elected politicians to make the decisions that they need to make, but actually then to execute uh, those decisions independent of the industry uh, that needs to deliver on that. Uh, and critically, if that, that arms length body then can join up the track and train and the delivery of that. Uh, by the infrastructure operator managers and the operators of the system. So that arms length body has an important role, can enable the evolution politically of decision making uh, to regional bodies uh, that receive their input uh, and, 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 and decisions. Beyond all of that as well, we're very clear that uh, whatever we do, as well as needing to continue to invest, we have to reform the fair system. Um, it is, it is uh, archaic in the way it's structured, it's not helpful for customers, it doesn't enable businesses to deliver what customers want, uh, so we have to start from the basic fundamentals of how the fair system is put together, reform regulation, uh, enable that to improve uh, uh, for all types of customers. It creates a massive opportunity as well 
uh, for better use of capacity. We have artificially created peaks on some of our long distance services. Uh, which can be smoothed and use better capacity. Likewise, uh, the peaks on our commuter services uh, are made worse by the fact that once you bought your season ticket, it's free to travel home uh, at the peak, even if you might happily travel home off peak. Uh, so the opportunity in both of those uh, situations is, is enormous to get greater, better use of capacity, uh, while at the same time uh, getting trust back into the system and enabling the railway uh, to continue to improve. Thank you for that. Susan. Well, good morning. I'm here bringing the supply chain um, perspective this morning. And um, I would say that the supply chain can, in fact, work with a variety of models. And from an Austin perspective, we operate around the world and we do work in different models and different ways with different customers. <coughs> At the same time, though, what the supply chain needs is consistency. And flexibility, which may sound like a bit of a, a, a dichotomy, but, but it's not really. Firstly, uh, we see a lot of boom and bust in the supply chain at the moment. So the combination of the franchise models with franchises changing on a fairly regular basis, plus the control period system for the way that network rail is, is, is working, mean that we go through these great cycles of, of recruiting large numbers of people and then needing to shed them again because we, we run out of work. And if there were more consistent pro programs, rolling programs, rather say than these you know, cliff edge changes, it would enable us to work more effectively. And of course, that would be one of the ways that we can bring better value for money. The other areas where supply chain can, can bring benefits are um, bringing global experience. So I, I agree with what Paul was just saying. If we had output based we can be bringing experience from around the world uh, to bear on the best solutions rather than delivering precisely what we're asked to deliver in a tightly controlled spec. We also have the ability to consider different uh, financing models if we have more flexibility and output based specs and if we have consistency. Because, you know, for example, we could be financing upgrades to the signaling, to move us into digital signaling, which would bring more capacity to the system, which is one of the areas where there's a great demand. If it were a model where you know, the private sector <coughs> invested in putting that digital signaling in the first place, but we were paid back on the performance of the signaling, again, that would bring great benefits for the passengers and the UK taxpayer at the same time. The, the current system has not been unsuccessful. Passenger numbers have doubled in what, the last 20 or, or 30 years. And at the same time, we have probably the, the safest, certainly one of the most safe railway systems in the world. And I would like to think that one of the things that passengers expect or want every day is a safe journey, as well as, of course, value for money and as well as improvements. So all those are available if we just look at improving the model that we currently have. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, and Sir Patrick, over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think I want to start by a bit of a reflection in a way, and it is a reflection uh, of pre-1992 <coughs> and post-1992. Because pre-1992, the railways were unimportant and the CPS would not be having a conference, uh, a breakfast meeting, discussing uh, the railways. Today, they are incredibly important, and therefore they are the focus of more public attention. We have gone from 700 million journeys a year in 1992, to last year I think it was something like 1.8 billion uh, journeys. And railways have become much more important in public life. Um, the idea, I remember, uh, when David Cameron uh, was addressing a conference in Leeds on the railways. Uh, the idea that any previous Prime Minister in recent history would have addressed a conference on railways was for the, for the fairies. Um, the, 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 the only reason that David Cameron got any publicity uh, for that particular conference was somebody ran into him and there was a security breach when he came outside Leeds City Hall, and that was more of the headlines rather than what he was saying about the railways. But I think if you look at some of our major stations, 
and just think how they have changed and regenerated areas. It, when I first uh, was uh, elected Member of Parliament, you wouldn't want to have spent more than five minutes at St Pancras Station or King's Cross. Well, most people wouldn't want to spend more time at King's Cross. That always gets a laugh, even at that time of the morning. Today, they are venues in their own right. They are magnificent buildings. And likewise, that has been repeated if you look at Birmingham New Street Station, the regeneration. What that has meant for Birmingham in a regeneration sort of mode has been absolutely amazing. And it's partly getting across to people sometimes that some of these changes, because everybody says, oh, it's all London. Well, it's not all London as such. I remember when I used to go down to the southwest when I was transport secretary, and they'd say, you're doing nothing for the railways in the southwest. And I'd say, we're spending 700 million pounds on Reading Station. Well, that's irrelevant to us. Well, it wasn't irrelevant to the southwest because actually it opened up quite a few uh, new track opportunities as far as the southwest is concerned since Reading Station has opened, which was a massive investment. It has had a fundamental uh, impact on the railway services uh, to the rest of the southwestern areas down there. So I think we should be, there's a bit of me that gets really annoyed that we're not really proud of what privatization has done to the railways. I, I understand uh, what, um, what Tony was saying about getting more open access. Yes, I favor open access, but we've also got to realize that somehow the levels of investment which have been put into the railways, which have been colossal, both by the private sector and the public sector, uh, need to be, uh, need to be uh, sort of, we can't allow that sort of investment to sort of be cherry picked, um, and uh, that it's got to be paid for. So I think uh, we, we risk, we risk sort of ignoring the great changes which have taken place on our railways, which have led to a far, far better service the reason why more and more people are complaining possibly about the railways is because more and more people are using the railways where nobody used to use them, nobody really <coughs> complained about them. More and more people expect them to be more reliable, they need to be more reliable, there's a lot we can do. I very much welcome what uh, the, Williams, uh, the work that Williams is doing. When we get a chance to have a Railways Act or Bill next year, it's possibly ambitious with everything else that's going on in Parliament, but I'm always one to uh, be ambitious, but I somehow think that uh, uh, that might not make the, uh, the cut um, of the uh, legislative uh, programme when, when we have a new Green speech, if ever we end this session of Parliament and get a new Green speech. Um, so those are some of the things that, that I reflect on as my time in transport. It was a, a great job to have in uh, government. There was a lot of it, there is a lot of investment going on. We're now seeing, you know, the pace of trains, which were trains that were 40 years old, running in, in the north are, are being scrapped. They were never scrapped by the last Labour government, they're being scrapped by a Tory government, they're being um, new trains are being uh, <coughs> along the lines there. I, I think there's a lot we can be proud of. That doesn't mean to say that we become complacent about the railways. There is more to do, but actually we've also made a lot of good progress as well. Is this actually working? Yeah? Okay, great. Well, <laughs> I'll hold it right, right up to that. Uh, thank you to all of our panellists um, for getting our discussion off to such a good start. Uh, one of the things that I think makes this such an interesting topic for discussion um, is that when you talk about the railways, there's both very deep technical challenges and questions to answer. Uh, you know, for example, when we get into the supply chain or particular options for reform, it's also a kind of hot button political topic as well. Um, and so if I may sort of kick this conversation off by going straight for the politics and then perhaps we'll move more into the, the technicalities. Um, Tony mentioned uh, you know, the Corbyn McDonald plans to renationalise the railways. And I think <coughs> taken within the, uh, the sort of spectrum of labour politics, it's actually a fairly realistic one. This is one that they could achieve as um, the operating contracts came to a close and so on. I'm taking the franchises back into public hands. So it's a, a real possibility. And I wonder whether, where Labour has this very clear policy, which unfortunately, in my view, seems <coughs> to be popular when you look at some of the polling. We know the Conservatives are against it. Um, <coughs> Sir Patrick, do you think that the Conservative Party has a clear sort of plan or idea of the railways, or is it still feeling towards one? I, I think 
what we saw was uh, the fiasco of the new timetable uh, introduction last year damaged the industry immensely. Um, funnily enough, there was a new timetable introduced in May this year, and nobody noticed because it was successful. And there was, I think there was something like a thousand new services that were introduced this year. Uh, and because it worked all right, every, everybody's forgotten it. <coughs> you're, you're always going to have problems. Uh, partly using a infrastructure which has not been updated or invested on as much as it should have been. So if you look at the, uh, the West Coast main line, that was, that was upgraded. It was 10 billion pounds of upgrade, but we didn't go much for, it didn't come much further south than rugby. So from rugby up to Manchester it was, uh, it was done, but not from sort of rugby down to London. And you know, in 1992, I think these figures are, are, are roughly right, there were something like 14 services a day to Manchester. Today there are 45 services a day to Manchester. And one of the problems is capacity. So when I was Transport Secretary and trying to get a new line to Shrewsbury and from Blackpool, part of the whole issue was capacity. The West Coast Main Line is one of the business railway lines in Europe. Um, so I think we partly, you know, we've been very successful, but we haven't been investing <coughs> over a longer period to the levels that we should have been investing. Uh, and, and that is uh, part of the the difficulty. So expectations have gone up, and Virgin Trains offer a fantastic service on the West Coast Main Line. Uh, there's no doubt about that, and much superior to anything that British Rail offered in the days <coughs> of operating uh, trains. So there is, I, I think part of it is, we're always looking for things to get better. Uh, I, I do like the idea of open access. Actually, up into Birmingham, because there are now different routes with Chiltern Railways, uh, and other services, there is quite a lot of competition, I would say. So there are certain parts of the network <coughs> where we do see um, competition, a lot, a lot of competition. Um, there are other parts of the network which I, uh, I accept what the CPS says about uh, seeing a bit more competition being uh, introduced in that. But as I say, it's not quite, um, it isn't as uh, easy or straightforward as um, sometimes uh, people would just say, from a, uh, a market point of view. Okay, and actually on that point, Tony, I wonder if I could bring you back in. Uh, you described this as one last chance in your opening remarks, uh, the Williams Review, and the need for a quite radical reform in primary legislation. Um, do you want to sort of elaborate on that and what your approach would be? Uh, are things really as desperate as you suggest? Um, I, I was talking to a, I won't name him, but I was talking to a Tory MP in a West Yorkshire, which is where I'm from. Uh, who is, was, when I spoke to him, at his wit's end um, recently. Um, I landed at Manchester Airport the other day and travelled to uh, York on the Trans Pennine Express but on a, at about 4 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. It was a three unit uh, diesel loco and it, took, it was packed to the, uh, to, to the roof, literally. It was not pleasant. A lot of older people with suitcases and you name it. Not, not a great sight. Uh, it was also full of people commuting back from Manchester to Leeds. The journey took far too long, it was late, and the conditions on it were appalling. Now, that goes on all the time, as I think Patrick will know, that particular Trans Pennine route is, 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 should be so, so, so much better. It should have longer trains, it should have been invested in years ago. Now, that is what is hurting, and again, I, I, I'm allowed to say this is a Yorkshireman, we have to start looking as regards transport investment outside London. And there are lots of, cons oh, I'm going to be quite partisan here, this is a conservative CPS, as it were, there are lots of marginal conservative seats outside what I would call the South East, which will t topple over if we don't make it quite clear to hard-working, struggling commuters, who have some, some of whom now abandon their trains and get on the only comes to M62, which is even worse, trying to get into work. And it's a really important issue, and if we don't address it quite quickly, and if we aren't seen to be addressing it, we are going to be in real political trouble in, in key marginal seats. And that's very partisan, I accept, but it's a really important point. The other quick point I would just like to make is freight. 
Can anyone please tell me, same railway, partially, why it takes a biomass train from Liverpool Port 16 hours to travel 99 miles to its market at Drax Power Station? It sits in a siding for four hours. The capacity issue here, as has rightly been pointed out, is an absolute aberration. And I would like to know why Network Rail is not mandated with targets to find extra capacity to supply customers. And that's something which has been missing for a very long time. We've got 40 million tons of coal off the railways now, not no longer being rail bought power stations. So that has freed up some, but this is totally unacceptable. I suppose Paul, you might want to jump in and respond there. I'd love to. So, um, uh, first of all, I think uh, we should be clear that the railway is doing an, an awful lot to, to improve things today. Um, Patrick mentioned the investment that's been made in parts of the railway, uh, but we need to make that investment in other parts of the railway that haven't yet happened. Some of that is absolutely uh, already going on, uh, and the, the trains that are being replaced uh, in the north of England, as well as that, that will be further transformation. Where that has already happened, customers see that and they respond very differently. If you like, the public perception of the railway hasn't yet caught up with what many customers are seeing is vastly improved service. And in other parts of the railway, it hasn't yet uh, been delivered, but there's, there's those plans and then we need to keep investing, keep improving, uh, however the railway is organised. Um, and uh, uh, part of that is, is ultimately a political decision about whether to and where to invest in the railway, rebalancing the economy, Decisions likewise about fares is the other thing that uh, causes customers to be very frustrated. The, the rebalancing of fares between uh, the amount of taxpayer pays and the amount that the, the taxpayer pays, that causes a lot of uh, uh, tension, if you like. Uh, but beyond all of that, we're very clear uh, in the railway that we need to change the way we're organised in some respect in order to enable this critical public service to be delivered uh, most effectively uh, with an important role for the private sector where it can deliver value. We believe that is important, so we believe to achieve that, there is an alternative to the current system which involves replacing that current suite of contracts with different sort of contracts, competition where it works, all of that, as I said earlier, underpinned by uh, an arm's length body to join things up, align track and train locally, uh, enable the right decisions to be made, inform those investments and other decisions. So, Yes, there is an alternative to the status quo, uh, and that's what we're focused on delivering by improving within what we've got today, and then making the case for radical change uh, to help us to improve much more over the years ahead. And uh, Susan, your company also operates globally, yes. as you said. Yes. Um, I think that in the railways, perhaps as in many other things, uh, we're inclined to pessimism in Britain and to think, you know, we're uniquely bad. The railways are much better in France or Germany or, or wherever. Uh, and then when you look at the customer satisfaction ratings and so on, it looks like we don't do that badly. In many ways, we do well. I wonder if, you know, speaking from your experience, um, are there things that Britain does particularly well? And, and, and perhaps, again, on the pessimism point, are there things we do particularly badly um, and where Britain perhaps should look, for, look, look, look overseas for inspiration? You're certainly right that actually uh, in customer satisfaction, I think it was 2018, was the EU survey, where the British Railway came out sixth, and, and France and Germany were, I can't remember which way around, but one was 18th, one was 19th in terms of passenger satisfaction. So yes, we do beat ourselves up, maybe in some sense a little bit too much. On the other hand, there are parts of the railway where things have been said here already, where passengers are not getting like. I think some of the key messages there would be um, areas like it doesn't have to be a new train necessarily. You know, refurbishing trains can be a great solution rather than constantly thinking about buying new trains. A train can last 35, 40 years. It, it wants to work during that time. <laughs> don't, don't leave it alone that whole duration. But we don't have to have a franchise system with new trains every seven or ten years. And, and the ability to, to refurbish a train can bring in, for example, new technologies. So there's been quite a lot of publicity in the recent times where Alstom are working with Evershot on how we can take an older product, a class 321 uh, from Anglia region, and convert it to be hydrogen fueled. So that gives an option of not having to buy a whole brand new train, but actually having a solution to 
replacing diesels in some parts of the country where electrification is not going to make financial sense, but we obviously we want to get a better product in place. That's one example. Uh, another one is, uh, another Alston plea, is the Northern Line uh, tube trains. So about a million passengers a day using those trains. And a few years ago, we refurbished them. And the passengers said, we know it's the same train, but you've made it bigger inside somehow. And, and well, we have obviously made it bigger inside because physics just doesn't allow that. But by refurbishing it, we're able to give them a better customer experience. So there, there are ways to do things which require some investment, but doesn't always necessarily mean it has to be something new. And one of the things I took from your opening remarks, I suppose, is the, the difficulty for a business operating what is a very political environment. Uh, because you talked about this kind of boom and bust cycle. Uh, and I don't know how closely that lines up with political cycles, but my, my guess would be that there's, there's an element of that to it. And, and also that it's built just into the model that we privatise our railways on. Um, you know, what, what would you really want to see? We've got the Williams Review coming. There's obviously discussion about reforming the railways. Um, in sort of practical terms, what would make you know, your business work much better in terms of creating that stability for the government? Sure. Um, as I mentioned a little bit in, in my opening remarks, it's predominantly around flexibility and leaving scope for innovation. So on the network rail side, on the infrastructure side of the business, the, the, the CP model is, is a big improvement, Patrick and I were talking just before we started, it's a big improvement on what used to be an annual rebudgeting cycle, but it's still on this sort of five year frame where things stop and then there's a hiatus and then they start again, which is very difficult in terms of employing people and, and keeping them employed. So if there were rolling programs, you know, five to ten year rolling programs, that would smooth out some of those peaks and troughs in the resourcing. And all of us in the supply chain would then all be running around competing for the same resources when there's a peak demand. So that's on the infrastructure side. On the rolling stock side, um, it's about having franchises which, again, have more flexibility within the way they're set up. The current system seems to be very front-loaded, so people buy new trains at the beginning of the contract, and, and that's it. And I think the famous example is um, the Welsh, the, not the current, but the previous franchise in Wales, which was a 15-year franchise, I think, from 2003, 2018. And, and there was no scope within that, within the model, within the, the predicted demand, which was for no growth in passengers in a 15-year time period instead they have huge growth, no assumptions of changes in technology, and what, in that 15 years we went from not, no iPhone to, I think the iPhone 10 or something, or exactly something like that, and think about how technology has changed in that time. But there was no <coughs> within that franchise to enable the sorts of changes that would have improved the passenger experience. Uh, that seems a good opportunity actually. Um, Paul, if you could maybe elaborate a little on some of those reform proposals that, that you and the RDG have laid out. And I know we've got a lot of experts in the room, uh, so forgive me if I'm just exposing my ignorance here, but I, I, I've got a, a sense of what outcome-based contracts would be and how an independent arms length body would work. But, but maybe you could paint a picture of, uh, of how you see the reform of railway working. Okay, so um, as I said, there's a, I think we need to have a suite of contracts for different markets. There are very, very different markets uh, in the railway, and, and, and customers have different needs. Uh, so I think that that's a, that's an important place to start. Um, we've talked a lot about the competition part, and I think that can be important in some places. Uh, said at the other end of the spectrum, in, in, in some uh, metro city areas, uh, where you have choices between different modes, be it the underground, or be it overground rail, or be it buses, or, or other ways of transport, cycling, whatever. Actually, the, the, the substitution between those is important, uh, and the, the revenue risk uh, is significant now in terms of flow changes between different modes. So actually, in that case, asking an operator to take that revenue risk doesn't necessarily add a great deal of value, but in our view, it does add a great deal of value to bring innovation in the delivery of uh, a, 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 an excellent service to customers in quite tightly specified 
uh, 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 requirements. So that's one part of it, and, and the, the London Overground, as I said, is, is the obvious model there. There has been significant investment in that model, that's great. We need significant investment elsewhere as well to make uh, whatever model uh, works. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, the, the franchise system in other markets where people do have more flexibility, there is more choice, there is more scope for operators to innovate and bring different ways of, uh, of, of operating. Uh, more outcome and output based contracts create the opportunity to respond, just as we say uh, there. Um, over a period of years, be it 7 or 15 years, things change. Um, and the operators need the ability to, to adapt to those changes. Um, and if, if there's more growth, to be able to deliver, deliver more services or, 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 or otherwise. And, and in some of the uh, franchises that we've had in the past, um, in, in the previous Northern franchise, for example, there was enormous change. Um, but actually during that period, it's quite difficult uh, uh, to innovate and offer additional uh, services, likewise in the Welsh situation we've talked about. So that, that an outcome-based contract in those sort of situations can enable businesses to adapt to what customers actually want uh, and enable businesses to adapt to what technology actually changes uh, is very different uh, to the situation at the moment where things are very, very tightly controlled uh, from, uh, from the franchise authority. Uh, so those, um, I think, are different models and they work in different markets, potentially with competition. But you have to have some way of joining all of that up. <coughs> and as well as all of that, you have to some way of bringing in uh, the views of devolved political bodies and, and the, the requirements they have to join up different communities and to provide additional uh, growth opportunities in different parts of the country. So uh, whatever happens in terms of the political evolution, uh, the opportunity for those uh, politicians, be they in Westminster or elsewhere, to feed in or actually what is it they require from the railway in their part of the country. Somebody has to join that up. That's what we think is important for the World's Arms Body depoliticize some of the detailed contracting decisions, the contract management decisions, um, that enable politicians on what they want from the railway, and then enable businesses to, to deliver that. Key part of enabling businesses to deliver that is to join up the incentives on the operations with the incentives on the track infrastructure manager. At the moment, uh, part of that is, comes through franchises, another part of it comes through uh, economic regulation and the OR. That needs to be joined up much more effectively, and then you can have different models in different parts of the country on the infrastructure, on the operations, different models for different regional bodies giving inputs. Uh, that can work much more fluidly, and it can enable then much more innovation through from the supply chain, because you've got a line of sense from track and train and their supply chain, and ultimately all of that can deliver a much better line of sight to customers. Uh, Sir Patrick, I'm, so I'm curious about the, the sort of political response to that, that vision of the future of the railways. Because, so on the one hand, um, if you're transport secretary, say, um, passing some responsibility to an arm's length industry body, that could be a good thing, makes your life easier. Um, obviously, from a policy perspective, I think we can all see the advantages of allowing train operators more innovation in how they, more freedom in how they deliver um, their obligations. But I suppose there's also a political problem here in that if, if someone's train is massively delayed, they miss their appointment, if it happens a few times, they start to blame you as transport secretary. Uh, and this has always been the problem. It's the problem in the NHS, it's the problem in many areas of, uh, of the government, that however irrational it might be, people do tend to hold the secretary of state responsible, and so that creates a political dynamic in which it's very hard to let go. Uh, is that something you confronted? Is that something you think that you know, a successor in your, in your previous role, um, might be able to overcome? Well, I think that, look, that's one of the biggest problems, and uh, there, there will always be, you know, secretaries of state, when we enact new franchises, like to say all the new services that are going to be included in that franchise, but it is true, the franchise document only becomes a straight gap, and adaptions can't take place over a period of time without it all being reworked, because we rely on a lot of money coming from the train operating companies, uh, back to the Treasury to enable investment to carry on. We, we still invest more in the railways than we actually receive uh, from the railways each year. That is because the pressures are always going up. I remember my first Christmas as a, the Transport Secretary back in 2012, uh, I decided I wanted to go and see some of the, the New Year work going on. And I went to Shrugborough, uh, the, the Tunnel at Shrugborough Hall. And 
what was happening there was that they were getting the tracks up, they were relaying them, they were changing the drainage, and it was a project, it was a small project in railway terms, it was about four million pounds, was being done over the bank holiday because obviously that's when you close the railway. And uh, for this four million pounds, nobody would ever have seen the work that had taken place. What did it mean? It meant the trains would go through that tunnel at 75 miles an hour rather than 50 miles an hour, and the subsequent slowing down and speeding up of trains uh, and actually it did lead to a much more efficient <coughs> service. But does anybody ever know we spent four million pounds doing that? No. And it's a small, it's a small amount of money in comparison. Last year you had a resignaling of, of Derby Station, that was something like 250 million pounds. Do people realise it? No. Has it made it a better service? It has made it a better service. So, so you always get that sort of investment which has to take place, which nobody's ever aware of and therefore they don't believe you've done it. Um, and uh, they'll say, you know, why aren't you spending uh, more money on, on, on the areas? So, so, so there is that dilemma, but uh, you just have to be fairly straight. There will be occasions when there will be an issue on the railways which leads to disruption. Um, but then there are on the roads. You know, you don't blame the transport secretary if somebody's had a, a, a car crash and the M1's at standstill for uh, six or seven hours. Uh, and that happens regularly too, but somehow we, we factor that in and we think that's okay. If somebody regretfully uh, takes their own life on the railways, and that is a big problem on, on the railways area, it leads to massive disruption until it is an accident scene, it is, a, it is an unexplained death for a while. So you then just have to be very honest, try and be as honest as possible, but quite often the railways don't like to sort of advertise the fact that it has been somebody that's sort of jumped on the tracks or um, come in front of a, a train to take their own lives because uh, you, you do see sort of consequences if you announce that that's happened that other people do things. I was on going, going back a few weeks ago on East Midlands and there were people trespassing on the railway lines. Why do people do that? You know, but they do, and it brings huge disruption. It's got nothing to do with the operator, it's even got nothing to do with network rail. It's all about being safe, and we do operate on the safest railways. Uh, in the world. It's always a bit worrying saying that because you're always slightly fearful of uh, sort of uh, you know, saying you've got the safest railway because you dread something happening uh, immediately after that. But overall, I, I think a lot of people do accept that actually the services have got better, the facilities have got better, and they want more. Uh, thank you, everyone. I think it's probably time that we take some questions. Uh, from the floor, so all right, I've got one right about. I believe we have a microphone heading your way very shortly. Okay, nice. um, and if uh, everyone, if you could tell us who you are and if you're representing anybody, that would be great. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this working? Seems to be. Yeah, great. Andrew Allen from Elite Gear, I've worked in the railways about 25 years. Um, I work on a high speed rail project in Texas, connecting Dallas to Houston, two big cities. The business case seems pretty good. But if you translate that to a big city connected to a small city that's only two hours away, that already has two railway lines connecting it quite well, with as what is described as a fantastic West Coast version of that service, the business case wouldn't be anywhere near as good. And I'm referring to HS2. So I'd like to ask the panel if we could rethink that. Would you support a rethink, a value for money test? And instead, let's take Tony's point about the law. Could we do, we take a fraction of the 56 plus billion of HS2 and instead connect Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, Hull, Newcastle, and create a real urban conglomerate, conglomeration using railways to create, I think, a lot more value than HS2. That's my question. All right, it, it, it's a big question. Um, Tony, do you want to go first on that? I'm very, very quick on that. I, I would support a full review of HS2 uh, when the new Prime Minister takes over. Um, I think that it has to be uh, a review which is external to the DFT. Um, I think that there is there are two huge opportunities for this country. One is um, boosting capacity of the existing network, which is very possible. I think we need to look at fast freight. Um, and I think we also need to look at the whole question of connecting what I call the M62 corridor. So we, I totally agree with that. What the review finds, of course, may be something different. But one thing which always confused me about HS2, and this is a little bit of a waste of time because it's, 
I suspect they're not going to happen either way, was the fact that the uh, railway would leave Euston, it would uh, stop at Old Oak Common, uh, but it wouldn't actually, it would connect to Birmingham Airport, but it wouldn't connect to Heathrow directly, which struck me as slightly odd, but that's another matter. Uh, so, Pat, you probably spent more of your life talking about HS2 than yes. you care to remember, but uh, give us another couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, one of the reasons why I want to go to Heathrow is because I've had a lot of expense to it, and it does stop at Olo Common, which is a crossrail interchange, and crossrail does go into Heathrow, so the connection is, uh, is, is clearly there. Uh, and uh, it was an attempt to try and reduce uh, some of the costs as far as uh, the project is concerned. Look, the simple fact is, we have built no new railways north of London in this country for 150 years. And if you go back to a few years ago when we had that terrible winter of disruption, every railway line in this country was at a standstill, apart from one, and that was HS1. Why? Because it's a modern railway built to modern standards, and therefore it was uh, unaffected uh, by the terrible uh, uh, roads, uh, the, the terrible, terrible where we have that particular winter. Um, we'll, there would, no doubt there'll be a review. I'm fed up with hearing about reviews of HS2. They, they come along uh, they, they come along by their bus load. The uh, PAC, the Transport Select Committee, the Treasury Select Committee, the House <coughs> Boards Select Committee. I hear Alistair Darling was complaining about it the other week. I was reminded that when we actually started HS2, Alistair Darling was Chancellor. And the job he did before he was Chancellor, he was one of the longest serving transport secretaries. So uh, take it from me, if you've been in the department and you move on to another department, you also keep quite an eye on what's going on in the last department you're in. So I, I found that fairly ironic. Uh, as I say, we're 10 years into the project. There is a, a lot of the work has been done uh, already. It is a project, one only has to look at Birmingham and see the kind of investment down in around the area that is already taking place, uh, that uh, I think is very important and it is being attractive. You don't have to believe me, ask Andy Street, he's the elected mayor, he says it is absolutely a vital project for Birmingham. Once it's gone to Birmingham, it would be ridiculous not to serve the rest of those major cities uh, in our country, not to serve Manchester, not to serve Sheffield, not to serve Leeds, or indeed uh, the other interconnections that you're going to get. People, some people say we should have started in the north. Well, that's quite, that's, that's a fine idea, but actually the biggest problem is coming into London, that's why it's a Y shape. So, unless you've got the bottom part uh, sort of operation, it's no good having the Y if you haven't got the, uh, the bit that leads you into London. If you talk to all the city mayors outside um, London, they are all passionate in that it is the right thing for their cities. Should we be doing more as far as northern connections are concerned? Of course we should. Uh, and part of the problem is that we haven't, in transport terms, had a long enough vision as to uh, setting a 50-year plan for the north. At least then you've got something to aim for. It has all been ad hoc. I think one of the things that George Osborne did in talking about the northern powerhouse and setting up transport for the north was to start to address uh, those sort of issues. So I hope we're on the right track. But yes, there'll be a review of HS2, and there'll probably be another one after that as well. <laughs> uh, Sir Patrick, I know you have to shoot off a few minutes early this morning, so just uh, let me take this opportunity to really thank you for your contribution this morning, um, and uh, you can consider your duties discharged. Thank you. Um, but uh, if you just join me in uh, a quick round of applause. For you. <laughs> Imagine there are a few other things going on in Westminster these days, <laughs> and especially today. Uh, so, uh, Paul and, and indeed Susan, I don't know if you want to respond on HS. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I might just go go back a bit um, in terms of why we started this in the first place. And and I was at Neville Rail, and as, as you mentioned, I was on board Neville Rail, and, and and we we were looking at actually how one of the requirements of the railway going forward many years. Um, and uh, through the key, key capacity constraint and the key opportunity to connect more cities was in the uh, London, Birmingham, Manchester corridor and the opportunity then to connect across the North Bingham. That was the start of this, it was about capacity and about connections between uh, major cities, about enabling the growth of our economy. That's how we started that. And then going on from that point, said, well actually, by the way, we've already massively upgraded the West Coast route. Uh, uh, with that uh, modernisation program, 
hugely disruptive for customers, but also transformational for customers. It wasn't the right thing to have another upgrade of the existing line and do the same thing again. The only sense of way of providing that capacity and connecting those cities was with a new line. That's how we started. Once you decide you're going to have a new line on that sort of route, you might as well make it fast because <coughs> the cost of going fast um, it just it pays for its own business case. So that's how we started with all of this, and I think we, we sometimes lose that in the focus on speed rather than journey time and connections. Uh, the second point I make very briefly is that in, in doing that, we have to, I think, see it as a whole railway. It's not that HS2 is some new and separate and completely different thing. It, from a customer point of view, it is part of the overall railway and how that works seamlessly to connect uh, communities, cities, enable that economic growth. And, uh, and I think we, we need to position and think the bank as being by investment in the whole railway uh, as a piece um, and the, the outputs that customers get from that uh, rather than uh, a bit of new infrastructure uh, and, and the speed at which trains travel along that new infrastructure. And so may I just, um, sorry, just on the, on the list of things to follow up on that very much, you referred earlier to feeding up fares and the false peak that's created on the high speed. The, the low factor on West Coast, Virgin West Coast, is only 50% of the factor. Half the seats are empty. And that is a fares problem. So absolutely we need to reform fares because of those false peaks and lots of other reasons. Uh, part of the capacity issue is not on the, the, uh, uh, those intercity lines, it's on the commuter lines. So the train I use uh, on the West Coast main line, unless we provide more capacity uh, through HS2 or some other means, then those commuter train services, Northampton, Milton Keynes, Leighton, Belgium to Watford, you won't be able to get on the train by the time they arrive because we'll be out of capacity. The benefit of getting last is everything's pretty much being said, but, but just to, to, no, 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 that's, that's fine, but just to reiterate some of the points. So yes, there, there are capacity issues, as, as you say, and likewise, I know a number of people who are doing those commuter journeys who are happy to come in earlier and earlier in the morning in order to get on a train where they can just get on, not, not necessarily going to sleep, but just get on the train. The other capacity issue is for freight. You know, if, if we can actually create more capacity, we can get more freight off the roads and onto rail. And that would be good both for the roads, for congestion, and for the environment, I, I hope, as well. So there, there are a number of reasons. But yes, we, we need both. We need uh, to look at infrastructure investment as a, a long-term plan, as a continuing plan, not something that stops and starts, and as a holistic plan, because you don't just need to transport from, from one big conurbation to another. But yes, you rightly then need to think about what else do people need to do in terms of travelling east-west or doing their local journeys. And that's that whole picture that is needed. All right, uh, another question, please. Yes. Uh, Rupert Darwell, uh, my background is as an advisor to the Virgin Rail. I worked on the first um, franchise on, on West Coast, and then I did the analysis that showed that the DFT could exist, uh, Tony said got its numbers wrong. And I think so far we've, we've, we've ignored the elephant in the room, which is the franchising system. People say it's broken, but it's actually more fundamental than that. The franchising system was conceived to bid for annual subsidy payments. It doesn't work when you are basically selling a business that is profitable. It doesn't work the other way around. And uh, Paul talks about procuring a service. The mentality is we're procuring a service. We're not, we're selling a business. And you've got to, and we, we've heard about how time limited franchises squeeze out innovation. You cannot have long term competition on railways with time limited uh, franchises. You have to create a freehold interest from the train operating companies so that they can grow the business. And to my mind, it's outrageous that a successful company like Stagecoach is effectively being chucked off out of the sector um, when it's got a huge amount of on West Coast, um, Southwest trains. You've got to, you've got to have a trade operator driven um, uh, sector. And until you basically have the guts and say, we are going to sell these things off, the intercity is essentially the long distance world, you will have this, always this dilemma. Is the franchise period too short, too long? 
Um, you have, as we pulled out, the, the early stock gets bought at the beginning of the franchise. You have these drafts in orders. A lot of the problems of this industry stem from the franchising structure. Susan, maybe uh, I'll let you go first on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think, it's like, again, as I said at the beginning, uh, from the supply chain perspective, we don't think there's one solution to, to that fundamental business model. Yeah. From an Austrian perspective, we work around the world, we work with fully nationalised state-run railways, we work with fully privatised, we work with concession models. They can all be made to work, it's the, it's the conditions within them that are key. And, and some of those points that I've raised earlier, which is about the flexibility, not fixing everything too hard, and, and having rolling programs so there's a longer perspective. And those can be done, I think, in, in different setups. Well, uh, Ruth, you made the case um, very nicely. I mean, I've, I've, we've talked about the fact that you can, I strongly believe on some of those long business, business pleasure markets, you can introduce a much more competitive regime creates those businesses that you were describing there. Um, and personally, I'd like to see that. If, you, if, if we decide collectively that's not what we want to do with those markets, we would then very strongly advocate there needs to be more outcome-based contracts to enable uh, the innovation. Uh, uh, you'd say that was the next best thing, but it, it's certainly the opportunity is there to create those businesses with competition. But if not, we must have more of an outcome-based system uh, for those markets. I told you just how radical should we be? I think we should be very radical. Uh, I do really think that if we didn't get this right this time, then we might as well pack up and go home because we will actually be having, um, um, we will we'll, we'll have produced a failed prospectus. Um, and I, I, I suppose it's, I should say that we have massive, uh, we've invested massive hope in Keith Williams because he possibly is the last chance. Um, my concern is that if we don't do something about this quite quickly, you are effectively writing the Corbyn script for him. Um, and I see plenty of evidence of that when I go to rather it, it conferences and events around the country. Um, I think there's two really important points about we, we've been said and we've discussed this before, uh, he and I, which is um, the, the nature of franchising in a railway which has grown very quickly is that the model is out of date. Um, and you are effectively, that's not really the government is effectively uh, awarding a state monopoly, a state sponsored monopoly to a company to run trains in the hope it will give it some money back. Now, the reason why they've always fought off competition in the past is that they've always said, well, the competitors will cherry pick our premium and we won't be able to give you the money you hoped you might get. Well, that was disproven on the East Coast Mainline because the East Coast Mainline franchise premium kept going up because competition was bringing more people to the railway. That's a simple fact and it's in confirmed recently in two written answers in the House. One key point I'd like to make, which uh, Patrick did make, and, and, I, and I think he'd agree with this, is this kind of idea that, and which is true, which is that you have ministers of state for rail running around terrified that they're either going to be attacked or, um, uh, you know, run down when the next time they're at kind of uh, King's Cross or Paddington. Claire Perry described her, her time at rail as, as hell on earth. Now, why is it that we don't have politicians running around terrified in telecommunications the maritime sector, which I accept is less publicly used, but it is an important sector. Aviation, if you're playing a few throw uh, this morning to Malaga is cancelled, you don't tweet or email the Minister of State for Aviation or his sub. If you are standing on the platform at Clapham and your train to Brighton has been cancelled and someone's been rude to you, you will probably angrily tweet the Minister of State for Rail and send her an email, him an email, Andrew Jones. The point I'm making is that we need to get politicians and the DFT out of this like we have with these other sectors, and I include highways, which Patrick referred to, <coughs> went to the end, you probably won't tweet the need for a <coughs> minister. Um, it, it is doable, it's very achievable, and when we do manage to achieve it, the, um, the, the, the outcome will be very positive. All right, well, thank you, Tony, and actually thank you to all of our panel. We've reached the point on my timetable where it says, uh, wrap it up. Uh, I promise we'd end on time, and uh, we've just about hit that target. So uh, thank you, thank you all.